The tide of Syrian refugees traumatized from the civil war has reached two million, half of them children. It's a crushing burden on neighboring countries like Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon, costing their economies billions. Some European countries have offered to take in a few thousand refugees. Others have asked help as thousands land on their shores. The conflict has killed more than 100,000 people in two and a half years, with little hope of a settlement anytime soon. What should Europe's role be in tackling the crisis? And how to battle aid fatigue among countries still struggling with a years-long financial crisis? I'm Chris Burns, and welcome to The Network. Joining us on this program, in Geneva, Melissa Fleming, Head of Communications and Public Information for UNHCR, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Here at the European Parliament, Christopher Stokes, General Director of Médecins Sans Frontières, or Doctors Without Borders, MSF as it's known, in Brussels. And also from the Parliament, Elmar Brock, Chairman of the Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee and a German member of the European People's Party, or EPP group. A question to all of you, starting with Melissa. How many more refugees could we see? We know we're at two million now outside of the country. How bad can it get for the refugees? Well, at the rate they're fleeing now with the horrific violence that keeps continuing, one, a, per, a new refugee comes every 15 seconds. That means by the end of this year, we'll be at 3 million refugees. So yes, it is getting to a stage where it's becoming overwhelming for the neighboring countries, um, and something urgently needs to be done to support them so that they can continue to keep their borders open. Okay, Christopher, you've been on the ground over there as well in, in recent months. Uh, what do you think? How bad can it get? Yeah, well, clearly all the indications are, uh, are really very negative for the moment. And refugees, people are fleeing for two reasons. Insecurity, that's the main reason, definitely, the conflict. But also because there's very little humanitarian assistance, very few services inside Syria for the people. And so, for example, some people are fleeing just to get health care across the border for chronic diseases, etc. So there's, you have the problem of inside security, but also the problem of lack of humanitarian access. Now, we're seeing a lot of refugees going, coming to Europe. How, how bigger could this wave of refugees become? How has Europe prepared for this, Elmar? I think we are not prepared for that in that huge amount. And uh, first of all, we have to give much more money. The European Union, which is the main sponsor for humanitarian aid for Syria, we have to do more in order not to destabilize even more countries uh, like especially Jordania, Jordan and uh, Lebanon. But they have seen also that the fundamentalist opposition is fighting against the Kurds who are flying to Iraq now, but also the situation in Turkey. Okay, uh, Melissa, do you think it's time for military intervention in the sense of establishing humanitarian corridors, safety in, in refugee areas inside Syria? Well, UNHCR uh, is um, impartial. We don't call, we, what we call for is humanitarian access. We call for people to be able to flee unimpeded. Uh, we ha are hearing awful accounts that of, of people being attacked as they're just trying to leave their country and seek safety in neighboring countries. Um, and we call for um, more assistance to the neighboring countries who are shouldering all of the burden, uh, most of the burden. Okay, Christopher, you can, be an you can be partial if you want, I guess, in this case. What do you think? Should there be military action? Well, we're not uh, calling for one side to intervene or another, but what has to be recognized is that a lot of states are intervening in Syria. Um, each state has its, is sponsoring Russia, uh, the Saudis, Qataris are sponsoring one group or another. And what we're calling on, if you can do a deal on chemical weapons, you can also do a deal on humanitarian access. Russia, the Saudis, uh, Iran have a key role to play here. Okay, Elma, this is in a way in Europe's interest, isn't it, to sort of intervene and establish some kind of security so you don't have a refugee outflow? Or what do you think? I, I think that's an important point on, uh, on this question of chemical agents uh, come to such a situation that we have also talk about that. And I hope that the Geneva talks will start so soon as possible for all sides in order to make that possible, uh, in order to have more access for humanitarian aid, have more money available, and have a better policy of uh, stabilizing the neighboring countries oh, who, okay, take, but, who have to take that. But, not, but what about boots on the ground to establish security inside Syria? What do you think? No, I think we have heard it from the answers of the two NGOs very clearly, and from the United Nations, that uh, they have to be impartial at the moment if they are combined with a military force which cannot be impartial in real terms or were not considered by the 
groups into uh, Syria as impartial, there might be even more in difficulties. Okay, Melissa, how destabilizing, let's talk about the neighboring countries like, Syri like uh, Lebanon, uh, like uh, Jordan, how destabilizing is this for those countries and are we doing enough to support them? No, we're not doing enough to support them. It's extremely destabilizing. I remember visiting a village uh, in, in Lebanon where the resident population was 3,000 and the Syrian population was 6,000. A very poor village already struggling and having to take this number of people in. There's bound to be trouble uh, and we're very, very concerned about it. And Christopher, uh, in terms of destabilizing, what, what do you think the world should be doing to try to help to shore up those countries? Well, yes, you have a problem in the neighboring countries. Aid and assistance is insufficient, but it's not only about money. There's also an issue around granting security and free humanitarian access inside of Syria. So how do we do that without well, boots on the ground? You, it can be done without boots on the ground. If a deal, if a political deal is made around chemical weapons, a humanitarian deal can also be made. And those states sponsoring and supporting uh, Damascus, for example, could also encourage them to allow free, free flow of humanitarian assistance across the front line in Syria and also cross-border from neighboring countries, from Turkey, from Lebanon. Okay, Elmar, what do you think, what more do you think the EU should be doing to try to shore up those countries, neighboring I countries? I think uh, to increase the pressure in such a direction via the United Nations and directly towards Russia and Saudi Arabia to achieve that. And I think, again, uh, we have to get so fast as soon as Geneva talks where the first condition is humanitarian aid before we come to the peaceful solution, which we have to do anyway which is the only outcome of this situation. Melissa, do you think the, the EU is doing enough? I mean, they're, they're the largest uh, area near the crisis. Shouldn't they be doing more, or what do you think? What we really need is also a burden sharing, as we call it. We need, Germany, for example, has agreed to take in 5,000 additional uh, in a humanitarian access program Syrians from Lebanon and from Jordan, particularly vulnerable people. We need more countries to come forward with schemes like this. Okay, Christopher, what do you think? Who should be doing more of the burden sharing? Burden sharing is one issue. When you look at the reaction in Europe of panic where the few thousand people arriving in southern Italy compared to the half a million in Turkey, for example, I think it's very, there is a need for burden sharing, but there's also a need for stronger political involvement of Europe to facilitate humanitarian access in the country and in neighboring countries. Elmar, how do we get stronger political commitment like that? That it's from you the and point. others? We have to explain to our citizens in Europe that more aid for humanitarian uh, work in Syria and around Syria is important to avoid more uh, asylum seekers. They have to understand that, that yep. it's uh, in our interest also to help, not just because of humanitarian reasons, and then I think we get more money for that, what is needed. Okay, last question. Very quickly, what do you think we should be doing to battle aid fatigue? A lot of countries are struggling with economic crisis. How do you tell them to try to help out more? Melissa. What we're finding is there is a certain fatigue, and the fatigue it gets worse the more complex the conflict becomes, the more parties in, in the armed uh, side of the opposition become involved, the more confusion. It becomes a big military mess, and the humanitarian needs, the children, the one million children refugees, for example, become uh, obscure in their minds and, and not as attractive to help. Christopher, how do you battle aid fatigue? Well, we found the European public in our, in our public appeals to still be quite supportive once the crisis is explained. And we find that there's been a too high uh, emphasis on, for example, Europeans going to fight in Syria rather than on the humanitarian issue. So it's a, a key area for us to focus, remain focused on the suffering of the civilians. Thanks, Christopher. That's all the time we've got for now. I'd like to thank our guests, Melissa Fleming, Christopher Stokes, and Elmar Bok. I'm Chris Burns, and until next time, thanks for connecting with The Network.